start now. Uh, the President of the uh, College of Medical Administration of Sri Lanka, the Secretary and the members of the college. Our guest speaker, Dr. Sujiva Hetty Arachi, uh, is a senior lecturer from the Sri University. Now uh, today uh, he is going to deliver a lecture on qualitative research. This is the one activity we are organizing on behalf of the College of Medical Administration of Sri Lanka. So I am Dr. Siddharth Dharmaradna, DDG Laboratory Services, as well as the chairperson of the academic body of the uh, CMASL. So uh, with the uh, idea of Dr. Lal Panapit here, this year we have conducted so many academic programs, and this is, this is one of them. I think this is a very useful topic because it's very relevant to your academic studies as well. Because we know our old MSc and MD registrars, they are supposed to do a dissertation or research projects. So you have to know that quantitative techniques as well as qualitative research techniques to complete that task. So having identified this importance of this having this kind of uh, lecture, Dr. Samandi Samarpon invited Dr. Sujiva Hetiarachi and also Dr. Uh, Avanti and other our uh, very uh, in members of the academic committee or at this event. That is why we are here in this today's platform. I think they feel it very useful for our all the registrars and the members of the college and the MSc trainees to fulfill the knowledge gap and the, the fill the knowledge gap and to improve your research when you are facing for the examination, post MD and all the uh, MD and MSc examinations, which is conducted by the post graduate Institute of Medicine, University of Palambo. Having said that, uh, I have a privilege to introduce and read the citation of Dr. Sujiv Hetri Arachi to introduce you, the resource person tonight, to the our audience. Dr. Sujiv Hetri Arachi is a senior lecturer in the Department of English and Linguistics at the University of Sri Gavadanapur. Additionally, he holds the position of the director at the International Center for Multidisciplinary Studies at the same university. Dr. Hetty Arachi earned his PhD in linguistics from University of Michigan and Upper USA in 2015. And he also completed an MA in second language education at East Michigan University in 2010. Throughout his academic journey, Dr. Hetty Arachi has achieved several awards and fellowships, including the prestigious Fulbright Master's Student Award and the Rackham International Research Award from the University of Michigan. His research interests primarily focus on bilingualism, second language sentence processing, and language teaching methods. In his research, he employs both qualitative and quantitative methods and has successfully published his research findings in a numerous international journals. Moreover, Dr. Tiarachi actively contributes to the academia by serving as a trainer in the qualitative research for several graduate and postgraduate programs. In the next academic year, he has been invited to serve as a visiting scholar at the Newcastle University, UK. So there has a long uh, citation, but uh, because time is very important, uh, I'm not going to read all the details about him. So uh, we identify as a really expert resource person in this field. Therefore, uh, I think you can have very productive discussion with him. And also, by listening to him, you will learn a lot. Uh, I think uh, because we know a lot of quantitative techniques, but yet uh, there is a gap of about quantitative research, in, uh, especially in health system research. Uh, so with that, um, Dr. Edgarach, again, I must thank and appreciate your contribution to even this college, we improve the knowledge and the skills of our uh, members as well as trainees in the uh, the PGM trainees. So they will they will they will ask questions. It should be an interactive session. I, I have no doubt that you will you will surprise them tonight. The floor is yours, Dr. Garaji. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Dharmaratna. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, deliver this talk or rather the discussion, to be engaged in a discussion on qualitative research with you. Um, I should uh, 
thank especially Dr. Samiddhi Samarikon um, and uh, for inviting me actually for this talk and also Dr. Um, Avanti for all the coordination work um, she has done over the last few weeks or last few days. Uh, thank you very much. So this is the talk, uh, this is the title then. So I'm going to talk about uh, qualitative research. Let me make sure that, uh, okay. Right, so it's um, titled as Beyond the Numbers, Unlocking the Hidden Depths of Qualitative Research. So let's see uh, what we can know, what, what we can actually get from qualitative research into the field of um, health research or how we can use qualitative research in health health related research or qualitative methods rather. So this is the outline of the talk or the discussion. Um, we will spend a few minutes first understanding what we mean by qualitative research or coming out with a definition of qualitative research and discussing the key characteristics of qualitative research. Um, well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the philosophy and all, but key characteristics in during this section. And then we are going to look at and explore the main research designs of qualitative research. So qualitative research is an umbrella term. So there are many different types of qualitative research people undertake. So in this section, so we will look at different types of qualitative research. Or in terms of designs, so what does qualitative research offer us? And then um, qualitative research process. How do we collect data? So how do we design a study? How do we collect data? How do we analyze data? How do we select a sample? How do we re uh, report the results? So some of these, these things, um, as time permits, we will discuss these things under qualitative research, research process. And also from time to time, I will bring in some published research, qualitative research from um, health research. Um, I actually spent some time looking at some qualitative research that is done uh, in health sciences. So I'll bring that in as well. So you can look at those as examples if you would like to design a study on your own. Right. Well, um, so this is the kind of the background for the study then. Um, I mean, the talk, well, we all know we undertake research to generate new knowledge. The goal of research is to generate new knowledge. So how do we generate new knowledge in order to generate new knowledge? So we have two different paradigms or two different approaches to research. Um, so these are generally called paradigms of research or approaches to uh, research or methodologies. So we have quantitative research and qualitative research. Well, <clears throat> quantitative research is um, generally based on um, positivism. So we call it positivist paradigm. So what do we mean by positivism? And what is positivist paradigm? Well, quantitative research is based on the assumption that um, there is a reality in the world that can be uncovered or that can be investigated objectively through research. So realists or positivists take the view that what research does is to uncover an existing reality. So there is, a, there is a reality in the world. And what is the job of the researcher? So the job of the researcher is to uncover that reality, explore that reality. So how is the researcher expected to do that? Using objective methods. So using objective methods, the researcher according to the positivist paradigm, tries to 
uncover the existing reality. So some of the key terms of quantitative research then is objectivity, right? And here, as this says, this means that the researcher needs to be detached from the research as possible and use methods that maximize objectivity and minimize the involvement of the researcher in the research. So subjectivity is something that we try to do away with in quantitative research. So that is so that is why we use objective measurements in quantitative research, in labs, um, or when we do statistical analysis. So that objectivity is actually preserved. Well, um, even when we conduct a survey, so we would we would use a use an instrument for collecting data in an objective manner. Now. Qualitative research basically is based on a different philosophy. So what is the philosophy behind qualitative research? Reality is not out there to be objectively and dispassionately observed by us. So dispassionately here means basically without the involvement of the emotions. But is at least in part constructed by us and by our observation. So the reality is not something that can be observed in an objective manner. That is the philosophy behind qualitative research. So we are part of this reality. We are constructing this reality. So how do we construct this reality? Well, through our observations, by collecting data, we construct the reality. So um, I'm not gonna talk about this philosophy behind quantitative and qualitative research in detail because the time doesn't permit that, but we need to understand that. So there is a philosophy behind qualitative um, approach and there's a different philosophy behind quantitative approach. So let's ask this question, what is qualitative research? And this is, so I will spend more time on this actually. So let's try to understand what we mean by qualitative research here. So what is qualitative research? Well, qualitative research is a general term. So when we say qualitative research, there are so many different types of qualitative research we can undertake. Well, um, what are some of the, what are some, um, qualitative study or design types that you have heard of? Anyone who would like to contribute? What are some different types of qualitative research that either you have heard or that you have conducted or any ideas? Uh, focus group discussion. Yeah, focus group discussion, yes, good, but that is actually a data collection method. I'm asking about what are different types of qualitative studies? Hmm? Case studies say... case... Sorry? Case studies and case theory. Exactly, case studies. So case studies, one type of qualitative research. So qualitative research is a big umbrella. It's an umbrella term. So under that, we have so many different, we have different types of qualitative research. So one type is, is case study, exactly. One is case study. And then we also have other types. What are some other types? Ethnography, phenomenological studies. So I will be actually going through that list later. Phenomenological studies, um, case studies, grounded theory studies, action research studies, and also content analysis. Um, so there are different types of qualitative research. So it's a, it's, it's a general term in that sense. When we say qualitative research, it can mean any of these study types or designs. It's a way of knowing, so it's a way of generating knowledge in which a researcher gathers, organizes, and interprets information obtained from humans 
using his saw her eyes and ears as filters. So this, this actually highlights one of the key characteristics of qualitative research. What is that characteristic? It's a way of knowing. Well, it is a way of generating new knowledge. How do we generate new knowledge in this uh, case? By using his so the researchers' eyes and ears as filters. In qualitative research, the researcher himself or herself becomes a data gathering instrument. If I do a qualitative study, I may become the observer. I may interview my participants and gather data. I may conduct a focus group discussion. I may make observations of documents that I'm studying. So researcher is using his so her eyes and ears as filters. So this is a key characteristic of qualitative research. And then, so researcher's involvement is very heavy in qualitative research. So the researcher is unlike in quantitative, in quantitative research, the researcher is trying to stay away from the study as much as possible. So that's what we mean by objectivity. We are using objective tools, but here the researcher himself or herself becomes a tool. And then it often involves in-depth interviews and observations of humans in natural and social settings. There are two other characteristics of qualitative research this sentence highlights. Number one, the most common method of data analysis or data collection in qualitative research is in-depth interviews. An in-depth interview is actually an interview which is long and it is not a very short interview like even in quantitative research, we may conduct sometimes interviews. We may go out with the questionnaire and ask the, ask the questions on that. Even that can be considered, a, considered an interview, but that is a structured interview. So we have a questionnaire and we ask the participant all the questions and we mark or rate, take down what we want. But in in-depth interview, so you sit down with so if your participant is a patient, you will sit, sit down with the patient. You would ask questions and you try to elicit long responses, very long responses. And once you have conducted the interview, you may end up having, once you have transcribed the interview, you may end up having maybe 20 pages, 60 pages, 100 pages. So depending on how long the interview had been. and then observations the second com most common method is observations you go and observe what is happening so those are the two most common methods of data collection in qualitative research and third now the next point where do we do all this in natural and social settings qualitative research cannot take place inside a lab so it is society that becomes the lab in your study. So you have to go to the natural setting. So if you wanna study the patients in the waiting room, so you have to see them in the waiting room. Their interactions are like, and all the, th everything that you can see observed. So they should be observed in the natural setting. And if you wanna study a community, you have to go to that community and see the characteristics, features, interactions in that community. So in education research, when we conduct qualitative research, we go to the classroom and make observations. So it has to be, data has to be collected in the natural setting. This cannot be done, done in a lab. This cannot be done in a lab. It can be contrasted with quantitative research, which relies heavily on hypothesis testing. So this definition, so this, sent, this part of the definition highlights another characteristic of qualitative research. So what is that? Well, um, so this is something which is different. So this is one feature, one characteristic which makes it different or distinct from quantitative research. 
which relies heavily on hypothesis testing. Now, quantitative research heavily relies on hypothesis testing. So when we conduct a quantitative study, what do we do? We study a theory, we look at a theory. And from the, based on the theory, we generate hypotheses for testing. We write down hypotheses for testing. So quantitative research is alternatively known as hypothesis testing, right? So we introduce quantitative research as hypothesis testing because we generate hypotheses. And based on theories or a theory, we may test, we may generate testable hypotheses. And we may design a study to test those hypotheses, collect data, analyze, and we determine whether the hypothesis is supported or not. So that is what we do in quantitative research. But in qualitative research, there is nothing called hypothesis testing. Or cause and effect and statistical analysis, that is not something that we do in qualitative research. So um, this is not hypothesis testing. So sometimes we see even when qualitative research studies are conducted, some people um, say, especially students um, say, this is the hypothesis I tested. No, you cannot test hypotheses in qualitative research and especially with numerical data. So these are, so this definition highlights some of the key characteristics of qualitative research in that sense, okay? So I'll move on and then I'll give the opportunity if you have any questions to raise. So I will also go through this and highlight because it is very important to understand what we mean by qualitative research to begin with. And also we need to understand how qualitative research is different from quantitative research. Otherwise, what can happen is when we, when we start designing a qualitative research, we bring in some elements of quantitative research. We, we don't know how, because we don't know how these two are distinct or different. And that should not happen. Qualitative research is qualitative research. So when we use qualitative research, so we have to, adhere to the principles of qualitative research. So if it is quantitative, well, of course, we have to adhere to the principles of qualitative research. And then um, this says qualitative research is an exploratory and in-depth approach to studying phenomena. Well, what is a pheno what is, so phenomena is the plural of phenomenon. So what is a phenomenon? A phenomenon is anything that we can study in research anything that we study. Interaction, for example, doctor-patient interaction. Interaction is a phenomena. Treatment can be a phenomena. So anything that we study in a research can be considered a phenomena. So any discipline has its own phenomena. For example, in sociology, we have um, interaction, relationship as a phenomena. In psychology, we have anxiety, which is a phenomena. Motivation is a phenomena. Um, so whatever we study is the phenomenon in research. Then in qualitative research, we try to provide an in-depth exploration of the phenomena. So the goal of qualitative research is to obtain or provide an in-depth investigation. It aims to understand the richness and complexity of a particular subject or phenomenon through non-numerical data. So this also highlights another characteristic. So it's non-numerical. Data gathered through observations, data gathered through interviews, data gathered from documents, focus group discussions, verbal data, visual data, so this can be our data. It's not numerical data. Researchers collect data in the form of words, images, videos, or observations. So in qualitative research, the emphasis is on gaining insights into the experiences, attitudes, perceptions, and behaviors of individuals or groups. So this is the goal of qualitative research then. 
in qualitative research. So what are we trying to do? So we emphasize on gaining insights into the experiences, experiences of people, attitudes, their perceptions, behaviors, and can be these characteristics of individual, individuals or groups. So researchers often look for patterns. So when we observe these, when we collect data on people's experiences, attitudes, perceptions, behaviors, so what do we do when we analyze? Well, we look for patterns. We look for themes. Um, we look for recurring concepts within the data to form a comprehensive understanding of the phenomenon being studied. So this is what we do when we analyze. We look for patterns, recurring patterns. So if it is a patient, uh, doctor-patient interaction, recurring patterns. So who is asking questions? Who is ask, answering questions? How many times does the doctor ask questions? How many times does the patient ask questions? So this, 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 what, when we analyze this, we can see a pattern. Themes, recurring concepts. So this is what we are looking for when we analyze a data set. So we do that. And why do we do that? To obtain or to provide a comprehensive understanding of the phenomenon being studied. So, um, so there are many characteristics that of qualitative research that I have highlighted in these two definitions. And I said at the beginning, or a few minutes ago, that when we do use qualitative research. We need to know how it is different from quantitative research. Um, what is What are we trying to do when we undertake a qualitative study? How is it different from quantitative research? Otherwise, well, we, some, we, see, we begin to see some elements of quantitative research in qualitative studies. And when this happens, people get criticized, maybe if it is a dissertation in the VIVA, I and mean, if it is a paper that is going to be published, reviewers may have issues with it. Um, they may say, well, this is a qualitative study, but why have you used quantitative sampling methods? Um, you have you are, you are claiming it to be a qualitative study. Why have you quantified your data? So these are some of the questions people ask. So when we do not see the distinction between qualitative or when we don't understand the distinction between qualitative and quantitative research clearly. So the nature of reality that we try to explore in qualitative research and quantitative research. So this, these two paradigms are different in terms of the nature of reality that we try to explore. This is what I talked about under, under the philosophy very briefly. So there is a reality that can be objectively investigated, okay, explored. And that is, that is the philosophy or the assumption behind quantitative research. Reality is something constructed by the participation, with the participation of the researcher. And that is the approach taken in qualitative research. And then what is the goal, purpose of qualitative research? Well, the goal or the purpose of qualitative research is to provide a deep understanding, comprehensive understanding of a phenomenon. Of if the phenomenon that we study is interaction. So what we try to do is to provide an in-depth understanding. It's not a superficial one. We are not trying to quantify it. So we try to provide a deep understanding. So when our goal is digging deeper into the concept and explore its complexity, we use qualitative research. And then in terms of the type of data collected, well, we have already talked about this. Um, this is almost like a summary of what we have talked up to this point, type of data collected. Well, in quantitative research, we use numerical data. 
in qualitative research, we use verbal data. It can be visual data. It can be documents that we have collected. So it's not numerical data, it's non-numerical data. And then objectivity and subjectivity. So we have highlighted this as well as a characteristic. So objectivity is a principle highly valued in quantitative research. So you have to be objective, you have to use instruments. Um, researcher has to be detached from the study. That is what we try to do in, in a quantitative study. So we try to detach ourselves from the study as much as possible. Otherwise we call it researcher bias. Right? So the researcher bias can affect the results. And that is what we say in quantitative studies. But in qualitative research, subjectivity is totally fine. If the researcher is making the observations, if the researcher is conducting the interviews, if the researcher is making um, observations about the documents or visuals, well, of course, subjectivity is something that is going to affect the results. So subjectivity is not something bad. So that is a characteristic of qualitative research. Well, we can minimize subjectivity to a certain extent. Um, so when we write and when we report, when we conduct the study or when we collect data, but subjectivity is not something that you can totally do away with in qualitative research. So what is the role of the researcher? So we have already highlighted this. The role of the researcher is to, in quantitative research, we try to stay away from the study as much. We, we try to detach ourselves from the study as much as possible by using objective measurements, whether it is in a lab research or in the survey research, experimentation, whatever it is, so we try to detach ourselves as much as from, um, as much as possible from the study or what we are studying. But in a qualitative research, researcher is heavily involved in the study. The researcher is heavily involved in the study. So we do the data collection. We make the observation. We may conduct interviews. We may transcribe the data. And we may go through and do the analysis. We may do the coding. And if you do what we call content analysis, thematic analysis. So the researcher's involvement is heavy. As I pointed out or highlighted in that definition of qualitative research, the researcher becomes an instrument of data collection in qualitative research. So that is something we need to understand. And this is very important this characteristic, generalizability. So what do we try to do in quantitative research? In quantitative research, we identify a population. We identify a target population or population in simple terms. And then we select a sample from that population. Select a sample from that population. And then what do we do? And we collect data, we analyze data, and we generalize our findings. Our goal is to generalize our findings to that target population. So generalizability is a characteristic of quantitative research. So in quantitative we research, we say we use Probability sampling, probability sampling. Why? Because results should be generalizable. We should be able to generalize our findings to the entire population. So when we make a claim, we are making a claim, even though we collect data from a sample. Now suppose like, okay, um, you are collecting um, samples uh, from some patients sample of patients. And then you are, your goal, if you are doing a quantitative study, your goal is to generalize your findings to the target population. But 
remember when we conduct a qualitative study, our goal is not to generalize our findings to a population. Goal of qualitative research is not generalizing the findings. Well, because of this, people seem to ask this question. Well, if we cannot generalize the findings to a population, to the target population, what is the point in doing qualitative research? And that is a question sometimes people ask. Is qualitative research really worth? If you cannot find, if you cannot generalize your findings to a population, what is the point in doing? Well, general, generalizing findings is not the goal of qualitative research. Now we are talking about two different kinds of fruits. So suppose we have apples and oranges. We cannot compare apples and oranges. They're two different types. So qualitative research is there for a different purpose. Quantitative research is there for a different purpose. So quantitative research, yes, the goal of quantitative research is to generalize the findings to population. But qualitative research aims at providing a deeper understanding, comprehensive understanding of a certain phenomena. So we try to see the complexity of a phenomena in a qualitative research. And then I will also highlight this point. When you conduct a quantitative study, there are several stages that you go through. What are the stages that we go through? We'll design the study and then design instruments, collect data, analyze data. Okay. Um, so of course, like, okay, we write down hypotheses and so on. And then in, <clears throat> so this is called linear. So there's a linear order. But when we conduct a qualitative study, what is going on? Well, suppose we are interviewing 20 patients for a study. 20 patients for a study. And we may conduct one study and we may transcribe the data. We may analyze the data and see what is going on. And we are not going to wait until we have conducted all 20 interviews to analyze our data. That is not how a qualitative study should be conducted. So we are not going to wait until the data collection is complete to do the analysis. But in quantitative, yes, we wait until the end of it, until the end of the data collection to analyze our data. But in quantitative, sorry, in qualitative research, um, it's iterative. Data collect analysis goes on while the collection is taking place. So we collect one interview, analyze it. When you go to the second interview, you may go with the findings. Well, of course, you can do after two interviews, three interviews as well. You can complete the first three interviews and do the analysis and look at the results. And when you go to the next interview, your findings can also be helpful in um, eliciting more data. So it is non-linear in that sense. Okay, that's what we mean by this characteristic. It's not linear. Process involved in qualitative research is not linear. The researcher may go back and forth. You may collect data, analyze, come back and collect data, analyze, and that it is a process iterative that goes on. And then sample, I have already talked about this sampling. Well, when you collect a sample in a quantitative study, we use a method called probability sampling. Probability sampling. Well, what is probability sampling? So, um, just to make sure that everyone is on the same page, I will quickly explain it. Well, when we, con uh, when we select a sample in a quantitative study, we have to do it. We have to select the sample while making sure that each member of the target population has a chance or probability of being in the sample. 
each and every member of the population should have a chance of being in the sample. You cannot ignore, uh, ignore anyone. Each member has to have the probability of being in the sample. That is what we call probability sampling. But in qualitative research, we use what we call non-probability sampling. Or we use what we call purposive sampling. Purposive sampling methods. So you can do a qualitative study with a single participant. So somebody mentioned about case studies. You can do it with three participants. You can select the participants who are from your own clinic. Um, you can um, select three participants based on convenience or they are available based on their availability. So you don't have to uh, make sure that they are representative of the entire population. Okay, in a qualitative study. Why? Because your goal is not to generalize the findings to the entire population. So you can use methods like what we call convenience sampling convenient sampling. That is one method of qualitative. That is one qualitative sampling method. So we can talk about in detail if any, if you need more details. And then, <clears throat> so I will get to the types in, to save time, I'll quickly go through this. And then variables. When you study something in a quantitative study, you do it by measuring some selected variables. You take some, so the phenomenon can be interaction, the phenomenon can be, if it is in the social sciences, it can be interaction, um, it can be pain, or it can be um, anything like, okay, all the, I mean, all different phenomena that you study in medical um, research. So let's say anxiety can be a phenomena. Stress can be a phenomena. Depression can be a phenomena. So how do we study that? Well, we take a few variables and we quantify those variables. And that is how we study. But in qualitative research, when we study something, we study the whole phenomenon together. We don't measure it in, or we, we don't isolate variables and measure them separately. That is the other difference between quantitative and qualitative approaches. So we measure it. So we select some variables and measure them in isolation or separately in quantitative research. But in qualitative research, we study the whole thing in entirety. So that is the difference. Take the whole phenomenon and we don't measure, right? We don't isolate variables and measure them. And then type of data analysis. In qualitative research, of course, we use, in quantitative research, we use descriptive statistics, inferential statistics. But in qualitative research, we use methods like content analysis, thematic analysis, um, narrative analysis. So those are some of the methods we use in qualitative data analysis. And then, of course, the writing styles are different. So when qualitative paper is different from a quantitative paper. And um, so in terms of some of the stylistic features, the way we report results, okay, um, and how long a paper is, how a paper is structured, in terms of all those features, qualitative papers are different from quantitative papers. So I have talked about these key characteristic differences between qualitative and quantitative research. So is there anything that you would like to ask? So anything that you would like to add or anything that you would like to contribute with? So anything is when any contribution is welcome. So any anything that is not clear or any comments that you would like to make? Yes. Go ahead if you have any questions. So if it is a, 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 a few people that uh, that is a population, uh, then you have to take them 
uh, all i think but if it is a larger group then uh, it is uh, possible as you said to uh, do a convenient sampling and uh, in your convenience like i mean uh, with the facilities available you can uh, uh, select them at your uh, own will and uh, interview them sir you mean in a, in a qualitative study yes sir yeah sure yes well if it is a small yeah small population well if you can you can do some focus group discussions and is there uh, a limit i mean is there a uh, limit to the is there a definition for the numbers of uh, participants that you should include sir? say no, that there you is have no a group of uh, 50 or 60 uh, population no, uh, no there is so no how much do you need to take no, there is no fixed number like that. There are some principles that we deter, use to determine the sample size in a qualitative study. And if you have heard about, this is one principle is the saturation principle, okay? Um, so, uh, well, we keep on conducting interviews and if we conduct interviews, we keep on conducting interviews. And then, so when it comes to some point, suppose like, okay, I conduct two interviews, three interviews, suppose I'm interested in anxiety or depression, and I keep on um, conducting interviews. And when I get to the fifth interview, sixth interview, or the seventh interview, I feel, well, there's no any new data that is coming. No matter how many people I interview, I seem to get the same thing. So we consider that as the saturation point. So Beyond, there's no point in conducting interviews beyond that point, except leaving out the individual differences. Um, we seem to be getting the same thing. So that is generally used in as such, uh, that is called saturation principle. So that is used to determine the sample size in a study. Other than that, there's no fixed number that we have to take in a qualitative study. So then isn't there a risk of... Uh us interviewing uh, like a biased group like uh, if you're not careful you might uh, gather uh, certain uh, kinds of people that may come up with the same type of uh, responses so mm. that you'll be missing uh, the big picture well um, if you use the saturation principle so there's it is less likely to happen right so when you when you come across like okay suppose you interview someone for fifteen minutes and you find out it's the same thing, and you may move to uh, someone else, um, and and you may like okay try at someone else. Um, so well, yes, but since our goal is not to generalize our findings, even even if that happens. Um, so it is not a big issue. People report those results even uh, because those are individual experiences. Uh, but if you try to generate a theory, now for example, there is a type called there's the design called grounded theory. But if you if you want to develop a theory like that, of course saturation is very important. So you have to keep on interviewing until it, you make sure that the saturation has actually happened. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, even then, like if you take a single person, of course, then you are getting only the perspective of a single one, right? So, um, yeah. So in qualitative research, you have that flexibility. Thanks. Yeah. So any other questions, any comments, anything you want to ask? Right, so otherwise we can move on. <clears throat> right, so there's a question about what are the study designs used in qualitative, qualitative study? I think that is where we are exactly going after this. <clears throat> right, so let me show you this. This could be, I thought this could be important and interesting for you. Um, well, qualitative research, as you all know, or you may have heard, actually this qualitative research or this paradigm started in sociology and anthropology, mainly 1960s and 50s and 60s. So as a research approach, okay, qualitative approach was mainly used in, or qualitative designs were mainly used in uh, sociology and anthropology. And then, um, so what was the goal? Yes, to provide an in-depth understanding and exploration of complex social and cultural phenomena 
but but 90 by 1980s it began to be used widely in other disciplines as well so education health research psychology even those disciplines began to embrace qualitative research so they began to start they they started using qualitative designs so according to Harris 2002, the introduction and adoption of qualitative research methods into medical um, education or health research started in 1980s. So since 1980s, so qualitative research has widely been used in health research as well. So this I actually got from a um, study which is uh, published in a journal about the growth of qualitative research in health research or qualitative designs in health research. So this actually shows only from 1980 to 2010. Um, so you can see how this has growth. So this is data derived from, obtained from Medline, which is a popular database that has um, millions of research papers on uh, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, dentistry, veterinary science, and healthcare. So covering many key journals, top rank, high, highly ranked journals. So this is how qualitative research has actually grown in the field. So this is making a huge co contribution to the field. So, but this is actually um, only till 2010. Um, so there are many journals which are actually dedicated for qualitative research in health sciences. Um, so. I want to let me show you because this could be um, important for you uh, if you are thinking of doing qualitative research. Um, show you this journal. Right, so this is um, qualitative research in health. Um, so this is a journal that publishes only qualitative studies. So you can actually find, if you want to find qualitative studies, this is a good place to look at. Um, it is a recent one, but it's actually published by LCV, one of the leading, as you all may know, one of the leading publishers in the world. And then, um, so this is another um, study. Sorry, this is another journal actually, um, which is older than this one. And it is so this is qualitative health research. So if you're interested in qualitative research and if you want to find the studies, different designs people use and you want to read published research. So this is something that you can look at, qualitative health research. Okay. So these are only two, but there are many. I actually, I found many journals that publish qualitative research in health sciences. Coming back to this, and one thing we need to... Um, look at these qualitative study designs. What are different designs that we have? Well, one common design is called ethnography. Qualitative, this is called qualitative ethnography. So we'll talk about each one separately. This is qualitative ethnography. And then the second one is phenomenology. This is called phenomenological analysis or phenomenology. Um, so if you look for studies under the title phenomenology or phenomenological analysis, so you will be able to find um, thousands and thousands of studies from different fields. And then case study method. So this is, I think, a very common one, um, even in health sciences, research on health sciences, so case study method. And then grounded theory studies grounded theory studies. And then discourse analysis, discourse analysis. That is another design, common design. And then we have narrative analysis. 
Well, one can ask whether narrative analysis should be under discourse analysis, but this is actually used as a different design or method. Um, this is collecting narratives, maybe let's say patients' narratives, okay, narratives of patients, um, narratives of people, um, like in different situations, contexts. And then action research. So action research is also qualitative design. Um, so we may not be able to talk about all these, but I will actually talk about a few of these, the main types. And then I will also show you some examples from um, health sciences, like research that has been conducted, published in those journals, mainly the journals that I showed you a few minutes earlier. And there are also other qualitative methods. So those are actually, I mean, people who study literature, when they analyze literature, when they analyze history books, people do history. Um, they use, there are different methods, qualitative methods that they use as well. Things like textual analysis, and they may not be relevant for um, your field. So I left them out. So these are some of the study designs, common research designs that you can use for your okay, research as well. So let's look at qualitative ethnography to begin with, qualitative ethnography. Well, what is an ethnography? Well, this is something that has started in sociology and anthropology. So those are two disciplines which study the culture, which study um, uh, society, how people interact in society. Um, so anthropology as a method or a design, qualitative study type or design, aims at describing the culture and social interactions of a particular group or subgroup. So people in 19, especially people who studied anthropology and sociology um, in 1960s, 70s. So they had to go and spend time with the community and collect data and study that community. And that is how um, qualitative ethnography began. So the goal is to describe the culture and social interactions of a particular group or subgroup. So it often involves extensive immersion in a setting, which could be an ethnic community, a school, a classroom, a hospital waiting room, a bus, an airport, a supermarket. So you can conduct an ethnography in any context, any of these contexts. Now, for example, ethnic community. So anthropologists, sociologists, they go to ethnic communities and they observe, make observations. They spend time with that community. And that is called extensive immersion. So you cannot conduct an ethnography without immersion, long-term immersion. So immersion in the sense, you go and spend time, you go and live with that community. And then you begin to see their culture, their norms, um, their behavior. You can make observations. So ethnography has also entered education, so ethnography can be done in a school, can be done in a classroom, uh, in education, in the field of education, there are many ethnographies on schools, classrooms, and a hospital waiting room. We can do an ethnography on a hospital waiting room. Um, just imagine how complex a hospital waiting room can be, especially in a hospital like the General Hospital Kalang. And we can develop an ethnography of that. So then what do we basically look at and how do we do that? So we, we can talk about that. Uh, but these are some of the contexts in which this can be used. So I'm saying it can be used in a bus even. You can do an ethnography of a bus. A bus doesn't mean here buses that we actually ride on like on high level road. Um, but I'm here, what I mean here is like, okay, People who just imagine like, okay, people who come to, who travel to Colombo on a daily basis from Goal on the highway. So they ride the same bus every day. 
and they meet the same people in that bus. So there's a kind of a community in, in that bus. They may celebrate birthdays and they may get together and they may have get togethers. Uh, they may go on trips. So there's a community that gets formed because of this mode of traveling. So that's, that's, that's a community in that sense, in that bus. So in airport, supermarket, so ethnographies are used in all different, in all these settings. So ethnography was first used by anthropologists, as I mentioned earlier, mainly Malinowski and Boas. So they were the first sociologists or anthropologists to use um, ethnography. Um, so since 1980s, it has been widely used in field of education. So it requires extensive field work. What do we mean by extensive field work? If you want to study a community, you should be prepared to go and spend time with that community. Stem, uh, 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 spend time with that community. Long-term immersion. So ethnography is extremely time consuming. It's not easy to do now. If you want to do, if you want to develop an ethnography of a hospital waiting room, so you should be prepared to spend hours and hours there um, until you have collected enough data to make observations or making observations, interviewing different people um, and maybe collecting documents, uh, relevant documents. So data can come from various sources. So long periods of time in the field. So we should be prepared to spend time. So ethnographies in that sense are longitudinal studies. They're conducted over a long period of time. Now, showing you some examples. So these are very famous ethnographies in the world. Now, this um, uh, the person who is here, so this is Daniel Everett, and he's a professor in uh, linguistics, actually, in one of the universities in um, Chicago. Um, so in 1970s, when he graduated from this University of Chicago, I mean, uh, when he graduated, when he, after his PhD, um, he went to um, one of the communities in Piraha. So this is actually... Uh, a book that he has written about the Piraha community in the Amazon. Piraha is a community living in the Amazon. So he went to Piraha and his job was to learn the Piraha language because he was actually a linguist by training. And he uh, was employed by a missionary company and his job was to learn Piraha and translate the Bible into Piraha. And he went there. He learned Piraha language. When he spent time, so it was long-term immersion. So he had to spend months and months there learning the language. And then after some time, he lost the interest in translating the Bible into Piraha. And he decided to do an ethnography. Well, he, he developed an ethnography of the entire uh, ethnography of this community. And that is what we call don't sleep, there are snakes, life and language in the Amazonian jungle. So from time to time, he had to spend around 10 years in the Amazon. So maybe three months per year. So he would go and spend there. He make observations, he collect data from various sources. And he developed this ethnography. So this has been translated into around like 25 languages in the world. So this is a well-written ethnography of a community. So this is an example of, a, of an ethnography of an anthropologist or a linguist or a sociologist. And then, so this is another one uh, developed by Srinivas uh, about a village in India. Um, so even though ethnography started like this, so this has, this is, there are, there are different types of ethnographies people do nowadays. So um, let me show you some examples of ethnographies from uh, the field of medical sciences. <clears throat> so this is something that I found. This is a study that I found from one of the journals that I showed you. So published by um, Elsevier. So this is... Um, Right, so this is about 
um, the dynamics of breast cancer screening approaches in urban India, an ethnographic study from Delhi. So this is a combined study conducted by um, some researchers in the USA and India. So, so this is an ethnographic study. Um, so I'll make it bigger so that you can see the abstract here. So they say using the extended case study method, we examine how the barriers and facilitators of cancer screening vary among different identities and the role of facilitators in mobilization. So they have used the case study method um, and they have collected data through interviewing, I source that somewhere. And then, um, so these are the, um, okay, the findings of the study. So um, if you go to this journal that I showed you, actually you can find so many ethnographic studies from medical sciences. And then, uh, oh, health research. So let me show you another one, which I found interesting. So this is coming from a journal called, once again, Qualitative Health Research. So in this study, um, So hope you can see that. Um, and then facilitation of person-centered approach in health assessment of patients with chronic pain, an ethnographic study. So they have collected data in, it, in, in the ethnography using participation observations. So I will talk about that in a minute. And they have used interviews and they analyze data using what we call thematic analysis. And also I will talk about this um, in a few minutes, okay? Thematic analysis, data came from participant observation and um, interviews. And these are the main findings, summary of the main findings. So it is about to, so right, once again, another ethnographic study. So this design can be used, has commonly been used in health research as well. And then, um, Okay, so there are different types of ethnographies actually, field ethnographies, photo ethnographies, digital ethnographies, auto ethnographies, meta ethnographies. So if you're interested in ethnographic research, so you should read a bit about these different types um, and then you can um, choose the best one or the one that suits, your, suits best for your own study. Um, right, and the other or the second qualitative type or the design that I talk about is phenomenological analysis. So this is also called quali qualitative phenomenology or phenomenological analysis. Um, so what is the goal of phenomenological analysis? To describe and understand the lived experiences of individuals who have experienced a particular phenomenon or situation. So basically what we do in phenomenological analysis is we're interested, we explore the experience of individuals. We are interested in exploring the experience of an individual. Lived experiences, experience or right? Um, that the person has gone through. So popular in fields such as psychology, education, nursing research. So there are many studies published um, on uh, many phenomenological studies published in these fields. So maybe lived experience of sexual harassment, a natural disaster, 
or a family with a kidney patient. So these are some examples like, okay, some, I took this from actually studies which are already published. So um, what we do in phenomenology or in phenomenological studies is to try to explore experience of participants. So the primary method of data collection used in phenomenology is in-depth interviews or conversations. In-depth interviews or conversations. So qualitative interviews are different, as I said at the beginning. So they have to be in-depth, long, and we try to explore the complexity. So we, we should be prepared to spend more time with the participant. In addition, researchers may also collect data from diaries, drawings, through observation, um, any sources that we can use, okay? Collect data from diaries. If the person has maintained a diary and if they're drawings, um, well, if there is a diagnosis card, so that um, and observations, all these sources can be um, sources of data. So let me also show you some examples from, okay, health science, publish research. So these are some studies in which they have used a phenomenological approach. Um, so this is a study once again appears in Qualitative Research in Health, the Celsevier Journal. And it's conducted by a group of researchers, I guess in the US, yes. Um, yeah. So uh, you can look at this abstract and you can, if it is readable, uh, read the abstract and you will be able to see um, what it is about, all about. Right, so they have used semi-structured interviews with 19 IHCA survivors, right? Um, and conducted to better understand their recovery experiences. So this is, I mean, they haven't used the term phenomenology, but if it is lived experiences that the researcher explores, it becomes a phenomenological study. And here then thematic analysis. So that is qualitative data, data analysis method, a common method, okay? So we derive themes from the data set, step by step. Um, so that method has been used. So um, this is an example of a phenomenological study then. Uh, let me give you another, show you another study once again, a phenomenological study conducted in um, health research. <clears throat> so this is also an interesting study. So there's a group of researchers in UK, eating to live or living to eat, the meaning of hunger following gastric surgery. So you can go through the go to the abstract and see what uh, they have done in this study. So you will understand this better because of the terminology and context is related to medicine. 
medical research. Right, so um, what are the data collection methods they have used? You can see here the goal of the study is mentioned. The interviewees accounts of this um, experienced, lived experiences of hunger and appetite. So, right, lived experience. So that's a phenomenological study. And then they have used uh, interviewing and uh, once again, uh, thematic analysis. So they have analyzed data using thematic analysis and the main findings are given. So this is another example of like a phenomenological study. So there are many examples of studies that you can actually find, okay? So I will skip and go through. And the next is case study, the next design. So, so far we have talked about Two, two designs, one is ethnography, and then we have talked about phenomenology, which explores the experience. So researchers are interested in the experience uh, or experiences of individuals. And then case study. It's a common method, once again, use. So what is a case study? It's a strategy for doing research, which involves an empirical investigation of a particular contemporary phenomena within its real life context using multiple sources of evidence. A particular contemporary phenomena, well, what can become a case? So we can study um, a certain phenomenon or we can study our case can be a concept or a phenomenon or case can be a person. Um, or a few people actually. Uh, investigation of a contemporary, particular contemporary phenomenon with its real life context. So it has to be in the natural context. A investigation has to happen in a natural context. What is the goal? To provide a specific and detailed study, in-depth investigation of a case or cases. So once again, the goal of a case or study is to provide an in-depth investigation, a complex, uh, so we try to see uh, the complexity of it. It's an in-depth investigation. So we generate data from multiple sources, maybe through observations, maybe through observations of various documents. Now, if it is a patient, okay, um, various documents, reports, um, and observations, other observ possible observations, um, interviews. So all these sources of data can be used in a case study. So case can be entity, any entity, such as a special education, can be case can be a classroom, case can be a situation, case can be a study program, case can be a person, okay? Case can be a um, teacher or a learner or a family, community, anything can be considered case in that sense. So there are different types of cases or case studies. So now case studies also in that sense, broad. So we can conduct individual case studies. Um, and then we can combine a few individual case studies and, and see and do it uh, as a set of individual studies. We can study a community. Uh, we can study an organization, institution. Well, uh, a ward in a hospital can be a case study. 
uh, hospital can be a case study. Um, a patient can be a case study. The treatment of a particular patient can be a case study. And there are case studies, so many case studies like that. So a ward can be a case study, a clinic can be a case study, the entire hospital can be a case study, um, organizations, institutions, social groups, events. Um, so if there's a particular social group that is coming for treatment in a particular hospital, and that get group can be a case study. Um, events. Um, here like, okay, in sociology and in other disciplines, so we, we study, uh, even a wedding can be a case, a uh, meeting can be a case, a party can be a case, um, a clinic can be a case, so various, various events can be considered as cases. So what do we do? How do we collect data? Well, in a case study, all those methods, interviews, observations, and then secondary data, okay? So the most common method is interviews. Then observations, we make observations. Secondary data. Secondary data is basically like any reports that the person has, um, any documents can be considered secondary data. Secondary data is data which is not directly collected with the involvement of the researcher. That is, that, that is, that is generated for another purpose. For example, diagnosis card can be used for research purposes, but it is not actually generated for research purposes. It is for something else like that. So then let me talk uh, very briefly though about grounded theory as well. Well, grounded theory, is um, another type of qualitative research. What happens in this method or this design is, we try to develop a new theory through the collection and analysis of data about a certain phenomena. Okay? So we collect data, analyze data, and we develop a theory based on our data. A theory emerges from data on a certain phenomena. Theory is emerging from the data and that is what is called grounded. So there's a theory which is grounded in data and that is why we call it grounded theory. A theory which is, theory explains something, so theory is grounded in data. So this approach can be combined with phenomenology if we want. It can be a phenomenological study. Um, you can look at experience of people and then based on the experiences of individuals, we can develop a theory to explain um, that phenomena. It attempts to understand how participants make sense of their experiences. Experiences. So um, probably an example would do this better. Um, I will get there. Grounded theory does not stop there. It makes use of the explanations to develop a new theory. You analyze data, you collect data, you analyze data, and you don't stop. The story, the story does not end there. And then you, based on your data, you develop a theory. Theory emerges from data. Um, this is time consuming. We should be able to, we should be prepared to spend a lot of time on this. Um, so when we talked about earlier data collection in qualitative research, we talked about the saturation principle. So it is actually something related to grounded theory mainly. So one best example from medical research is the theory about the grieving process or the grief process. Um, Research has revealed that people who have experienced the death of a close relation or family member um, progress through a series of stages during their grief. So when they grieve the death of a close relation or family member, 
So they go, go through various stages. And how do we know this? Well, we know this because of research or grounded theory studies people have conducted. Well, what are the stages that people go through generally? So this is now there is a theory about it. And this theory comes from grounded theory. I mean, grounded theory research. So the first stage people go through, so this is kind of like a grieving cycle. So when someone grieves the death of a close friend or a, a relation or a, a friend, so the first stage they go through, according to research findings, is a denial. They refuse to accept the death of this closer one. So maybe there are people who are actually familiar with this and um, here already. Um, but the second step is called anger. So this is, um, so anger could be towards himself or herself. Uh, basically, like I could be angry because and if my pet has died and I could be angry because of myself, because I have not done enough to, I may feel guilty that I have not done enough to save it. something like that. And then depression. So there's a period during which the person can get depressed. And then um, finally, the person is coming to terms with, comes to terms with uh, the loss. So how do we know this grieving cycle? And this has come from grounded theory research. So this knowledge is generated through work. Um, so the how so this theory has been developed based on data collected from maybe many different participants. People have lost someone okay close in their life. So the researchers must have interviewed these people. Um, over and over again, maybe same person. So the same person has to be interviewed when we develop a theory like this at different intervals. Maybe a um, few weeks after the loss or maybe immediately after the loss, few weeks after the loss and so on, few months after the loss. So data collection is generally done in a grounded theory study using interviews and observations. Um, data collection analysis proceed concurrently. So this is something I highlighted at the beginning as well. In a qualitative study, you don't wait until the study is completed or the data collection is completed to analyze your data. In a quantitative study, we generally analyze our data after the data collection. But in a qualitative study, data collection Data analysis should happen concurrently, simultaneously. You collect data, you may go through it, analyze. When you go to the next interview, you have an analysis. You know the findings, at least roughly. And then that can also contribute to your interview, the second interview, and third interview, fourth interview. So it goes on like that. And then, right. So this is uh, grounded theory studies. So now since we are um, right, so it has been one and a half hours almost. So I'll quickly show this one as well, narrative analysis. Um, so what is a narrative analysis? So here, um, let me show you an example of a narrative analysis from uh, uh, once again, published in one of the journals, Qualitative Research on Health Sciences. And then this will help, help you understand this better. So this is a tale of childhood loss, conditional acceptance, and a fear of abandonment. Qualitative study taking a narrative approach to eating disorders. So this is once again published in Qualitative Health Research. So you can read this um, abstract and this will give you an overview of what this is all about.
Well, one thing you may notice about this is that, well, there's this lived experiences. So that means it is um, phenom so this there's an overlap with phenomenology. Um, but this is mainly a narrative. So in narrative analysis, what we do is we generate narratives. We generate narratives. What is a narrative? Well, narrative is a story. So each person, each participant has a narrative or a story to tell. So as medical practitioners, you know that better. So each patient you get has a narrative, has a story to tell. And if you allow the person to tell the story, that person would go on and on. So has a story to tell. So in what we're interested in narrative analysis is actually we explore these narratives. Um, we get them to tell their story. So it can be either about themselves or a set of events. Can be about their illness. Um, anything, depending on the focus of the study. So instead of looking for themes that emerge from an account, it concentrates on the sequential unfolding of someone's story. So how is how does the story unfold? How does it get told? Um, so we are looking at that organization, sequential unfolding as well. So um, in narrative analysis, we are interested in summary stories people have got to say. Well, sometimes you may say that those stories are like experiences. Well, um, narrative is not always um, it's not confined to experiences. It could be different. So that is why there's a different design or tradition called narrative analysis. And there's another design which is commonly used in medical um, or health-related research, and that is a discourse analysis. So discourse analysis has commonly been used in fields such as, um, let's say, sociology, linguistics, um, mass communication in fields like those but this is used this has been used in medical research as well health research as well discourse refers to actual language in use encompassing all forms of spoken or written communication so well discourse means real language that we use when when a doctor is involved in a conversation or interaction with the patient. So the language, the actual language use is called discourse. It involves the study of language beyond individual words and sentences. We are not looking at words, sentence, sentences, but discourse as a whole, when everything is connected, right? So we call it a discourse. All the sentences um, together may be produced by the by, by all the interlocutors, so doctor and the patient. Uh, so the patient may um, ask, answer a question, doctor may ask a question, everything together is called a discourse. Focusing on how language functions in different contexts and social interactions. So discourse analysis is mean, the structure, organization and patterns of language to understand how meaning is created, negotiated, conveyed through communication in conversations, interviews, speeches, written text, social media interactions, anything can be, or oh, these are different contexts in which discourse is used. So um, let me give you some examples, show you some examples um, from health-related research. Conversation analysis has widely been used in health research to explore, explore doctor-patient interaction. So an important review of this line of research is provided in um, so these articles. And if anyone is interested in that, um, let me um, show you an example of that. Um, if you are interested in this line of research, so this is um, an example. So this is considered a prominent article. The one that I'm going to show you um, is coming on, right. So it's a prominent one, conversation analysis, a new model of research in doctor-patient communication. 
So this course conversation analysis is part of this course analysis, okay? So this is um, how it can be used in uh, medical research. So this is a highly cited journal article. Um, so this is on Journal of Royal Society of Medicine, um, so which is a um, highly ranked journal. And then um, index journal in other terms. So let me show you uh, another one here, if possible. So um, this is another study that I found in which they have used um, discourse analysis. So in this one, analyzing interaction between doctors and patients in primary care encounters, um, communication in medical care. So this is a publication by Cambridge and um, okay, it's 2009. So, so there is an article on that. So um, yeah, if you're interested in these, so there are many resources. Um, if you want to see how discourse analysis or conversation analysis is used in medical research, there are many resources. So if you want, I can um, actually send these slides as well. So if that is helpful for you to look at. Right, so those are the main designs that I am going to talk about then. Um, so those are the main designs. So we have talked about uh, then um, many common designs, qualitative designs that we see in uh, health-related research. Um, okay, ethnography, phenomenological studies, case studies, grounded theory, discourse analysis, analysis and action research is the only thing we have a goal of solving a problem. Um, so you identify a problem and your goal is to solve that problem. And then you introduce some action we call an intervention. And then um, there may be in this audience, uh, there may be um, people who are familiar with this method. So we introduce, uh, we change something about the situation or in that context. And we see how that, what change it brings. Um, so that is basically what action research is all about. But I don't have time to um, talk about it in detail. So I think with this, um, I should open it up for the um, for you. If you have any questions, comments, um, if anything is not clear, and if you want to comment on anything we've talked about. So um, I'll open it for you guys. And so you can ask any questions you have then. So we can talk about it. Any questions, anything to clarify, anything to add? The floor is open. Any questions, please? Sir, can you please explain a little bit more about the thematic analysis? Ah, yes, that is something where we actually could not do. Yeah, thematic analysis is a, a common method of data analysis used in qualitative research. Now, this is what happens. I think it would be better to have a separate session or something like a workshop, something like that um, for that. But I'll uh, briefly tell you what that is all about. So suppose you conduct interviews. Now you have conducted an interview with the participant. So generally we must audio record the interview. Without that, it's very difficult to do an analysis. You must get the, you, you must get the permission, of course. Uh, we have to get the um, ethical approval and all, um, human subjects approval. And then after that, we record the interview. And then we transcribe the interview. So transcribe it. So you prepare a written version of the entire interview. And so this is how qualitative data is analyzed, mainly using thematic analysis. Then, then we 
use something called um, 3C approach, and that is a common approach. So we first identify codes and we assign some words or phrases to summarize some of the uh, some sections of the data. So we identify some keywords or we use keywords to um, summarize, uh, to ref uh, represent the essence of what the participant is saying. And that is called coding. And after coding, we do something called categorizing. Codes that go together are put, put together or they are categorized. Um, and they end up in different categories. And after that, after categorizing, we do what we call developing themes or concepts. So 3C, it is called 3C approach, coding, categorizing and concepts or forming concepts. So concepts are themes. We develop themes, these are broader. Okay, start with coding. Sometimes once you have interviewed someone, when you have coded an interview, you may have around maybe 40 codes. And when you have categorized, you may reduce it to maybe like, okay, 10, eight or 15. And then when you do themes, develop themes, you may have around like five themes. So step by step, that is how we interpret qualitative data. It makes sense. Okay. Uh, I think it has to be practically done. It's very difficult to um, learn it without doing it. So it's, uh, it, 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 is a, it involves a process. Anything else? Uh, in uh, qualitative analysis that uh, when we are using tools hmm. that uh, uh, is there any differences and uh, uh, or what is uh, better to use that is uh, when we are doing uh, in our medical research so you mean uh, what do you mean by tools is it uh, data analysis tools yeah right yeah you can use um, tools like i don't know whether you have heard about the NVivo. NVivo is the most common software people use for analyzing qualitative data. Um, that can be used to um, actually generate or make sense of uh, qualitative data. So that is that is the most common one. Um, we can do it manually as well. So coding, categorizing, and forming concepts, so developing themes can be done manually as well. We can do using something software like NVivo. Um, the, the good thing about it is NVivo is you can actually generate uh, nice graphics uh, of qualitative data. You can develop word clouds and you can, you can show the relationship. You can do kind of like mind maps, um, how words are related, how concepts are related. Uh, you can do nice graphics with actually um, in vivo. It is better if we can use in vivo. Um, it is not very difficult to learn how to use in vivo. Only thing is it is, uh, so license version is a uh, little expensive, but you can find versions lo available locally. Um, that is a very useful tool. Um, we can use that tool to or software to analyze qualitative data. Thank you, sir. Right. Any other questions? Anything to add? Anything to ask? I guess there are, there are. Yeah, so this is, there's a question about, uh, can you explain about the presentation of qualitative research? Yeah, qualitative uh, presentation means um, how results are reported, um, how a paper is um, organized. Well. Um, I think this is something that we have to um, we have to go through, learn by going through papers that have been published. So when you have codes, when you have categories, when you have themes, generally we organize a paper in terms of the themes. Now I showed you several examples or so several sample qualitative papers from health related research. So they have organized their papers 
under themes. Um, then they also actually record all the codes that they have generated. These are the codes we have generated. And uh, they, if they can uh, create graphics using um, NVivo, if they use something like NVivo, they can be shown. Um, presentation is uh, something that I think we can easily learn by looking at some of the published papers. Um, it's, uh, I think, I don't think we have time to go through a paper and learn that, but I guess some, that is something you can um, do on your own by looking at some papers, selected papers. Um, yeah, anything else? So what does uh, triangulation of qualitative data mean? Yeah, that's a very good question. Like, okay, data triangulation. So triangulation means collecting data, eliciting data from various sources. Now, for example, suppose you are developing uh, a qualitative ethnography of a hospital waiting room. Now, you can interview participants, but you're not going to rely only on interviews. You can also make observations. So you're going to triangulate your data with observations. And then you may also observations, and you may collect secondary data. Um, all the other sources that you you can you have access to. So basically, data triangulation is uh, verifying data collected from one source using another source, or to support data collected from one source using another source. So good example is interview and observations. Don't rely only on interviewing. Use observations also. Then that can right. So that can be used that can triangulate your data. Yeah, I hope that is clear. Yes, sir. thank you. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Anything to clarify or anything to ask? Yes, still the forum is open for uh, questions and answers. Do you have any questions? If not, we can wrap up the Mr. session now. now. Uh, again, just... Mr. Jeeva now. Mr. Jeeva. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Can you tell something about, something about content analysis as well? Because now, uh, what's right. the difference between content analysis and the uh, thematic analysis? Yeah. Content analysis is a broad. Now, if you like, you can, you are in a qualitative study, even photographs can be your data. So especially when you develop a photo ethnography of something, you can even take pictures and analyze. Now, for example, let's say hospital waiting room. You can take pictures, photographs and analyze them. And those photographs can be very revealing. They can reveal a lot. I'm not saying that is the only thing, but is that could be one source of data. Now, when you analyze the photograph, well, how are you going to analyze it? You are going to use content. You are analyzing the content. But there you may not be coding and there may not be like, okay, you, you are assigning an interpretation to it. So content analysis broadly, any method that you use, okay, to assign an interpretation to your data. So when you do thematic analysis, thematic analysis comes under content analysis. You have a specific, you use a specific method. You use, you start with codes and then you develop gradually themes out of those codes. Content analysis. Now, when you take secondary data, you are doing a con you are analyzing the content there. Or you take observations, you analyze the content. There are various models that have been developed to analyze the content. Okay. Thematic analysis is only one method of content analysis. I think that is basically uh, what I can say right now because content analysis, there are various models of uh, qualitative data analysis that can be considered content analysis. Thank you. 
Any right. questions? Oh, so, no, uh, yeah. Doctor, yeah. yes, there are three questions. Uh -huh, okay, right. Let me, yes, let me see. Yes. yes. One is like about when we transcribe in, the, uh, in thematic analysis, if we interview 30 participants, do we have to write word to word or can we summarize? No, we cannot summarize. We have to transcribe the entire interview. Unfortunately, it's going to be a lot of work, but in qualitative analysis, we have to do transcribe the entire thing. If we summarize, we can accidentally miss something, okay? Exact words of the participants should be there. And that is our data. So we are not going to, if we summarize, we can end up distorting data. So that is something we have to be very careful about, okay? So we cannot distort, we cannot, uh, we cannot do any damage to the data, right? So we cannot do anything. So they should be represented as they are. So no summarizing then. Uh, I think. And we are asking like, could you please share the example shown to uh, refer to later? Yeah, I can certainly do that. I, I can send it to uh, someone, uh, probably uh, Dr. Um, I wanted to share it with the group if they are interested in looking at those. Is that all? All the questions, Dr. Dharmaratna? So, okay, okay so one more question. Yeah, Dr. Sajivan, ah, okay. almost nine o'clock. Yeah, only one question. Yes. <laughs> only, yeah. only, only, one, only one question, one sir. Now, uh, we know systematic oh. review produces strong evidence, right? Uh, what are your views on systematic evidence, systematic review in qualitative studies? Systematic review of qualitative studies. Yep. Um, yeah, that is done. That is possible. So there is something called, um, so I don't know whether I showed that to you. Systematic reviews uh, can be done. They are done actually even in qualitative research. Um, let me show you this, um, right. So there is something called meta-ethnography. Now this is something uh, similar to that, meta-ethnography. So meta in meta ethnography, what we do is synthesize findings of individual ethnographical studies to create create new interpretations and insights. Um, I think uh, systematic reviews are useful. So this is something like a systematic review. So we look at different ethnographical studies on the same phenomenon, and we try to summarize and we try to interpret, uh, create new interpretations and insights. So systematic reviews are just like they are commonly used in quantitative research, they are equally um, important in qualitative research. They can certainly make a contribution. Yeah, I have seen actually qualitative uh, studies, systematic reviews on qualitative uh, research. Okay, uh, one last question, sir. Now, yeah. qualitative studies are subjective, right? Mm. How does this subjectivity affect systematic mm. reviewing? Uh, subjectivity affects systematic reviewing? Yep. Um, what do you mean by that? How does now, it now, affect? Uh, yes. Now, systematic reviewing, we commonly do in quantitative analysis, right? Yeah. Quantitative analysis, because uh, we have objectivity there. Yeah. Right? The qualitative studies, what we have is subjectivity, sir. Now, how, yeah. how can we overcome this challenge in doing systematic reviewing in qualitative studies, in your opinion? <laughs> well, my, in my opinion, you don't have to try to, you cannot try yeah. to overcome subjectivity, right? Subjectivity is characteristic and part of qualitative research. So when you do a review, well, we admit that. We have to admit that these findings um, can be affected by subjectivity or has been affected by subjectivity. So uh, we admit that. Uh, we do it while admitting subjectivity. I think, uh, so only thing is, if you look at this from the angle uh, of a quantitative research, uh, that is where the problem arises. We have to, we, we have to accept qualitative research as they are. Now, for example, in meta-ethnography, when we do meta-ethnographical <coughs> study, um, well, we look at individual studies. Those individual studies must have been affected by subjectivity. So that is totally fine. We don't try to reduce it or uh, do away with it. We cannot. 
Okay. If the original okay. studies are subject, uh, if they are characterized by subjectivity, we cannot avoid it when we do when we do, do a review. Yes. I yes. don't know whether you agree, but that yes, is sir. that is my personal yeah. view. Yes, okay. true, sir. Uh, you know, subjectivity yeah. is there. Collective studies, yes, understood. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is the beauty of this quality of research, subjectivity. That's the beauty. Yeah. And also now, this is one of the, uh, the most important lecture you delivered, Dr. Sujiva. I'm really delighted with the presentation, right? Uh, our uh, members and our trainees can read thousand uh, homebooks, but you can't get this knowledge. Uh, I think within two hours, you have gained a lot of knowledge uh, in part on our, upon them. So it's really wonderful and amazing. I'm very happy with the presentation. Uh, so now, uh, as everybody knows that uh, this, uh, uh, our, uh, any, any quality research is very time consuming. So if you are given to ask questions, they will ask more questions. And so no time, there's no time to answer all the questions. But if our trainees really need to know more than about quality research, so we think about, we discuss in academic committee to have another lecture from Dr. Sajiva if the time permits. Uh, with that note, so I want to conclude this uh, uh, present, uh, the, 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 uh, session and also I would like to ask uh, Dr. Avanti uh, because Dr. Avanti, Dr. Samindi, Dr. Ayanti, there are keen members uh, who are really interested of in this topic. So while appreciating all the, the support given by the members of the academic committee and the president of the College of Lalpana Pitya, uh, may I invite Dr. Avanti to uh, propose word of thanks. Yes, uh, very good. Very good evening to all the participants and our distinguished resource person, Dr. Sujiv Hetty Arachi, for making our online session on qualitative research and enlightening and enriched experience. Um, this session is actually organized by the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, aimed to broaden our understanding of qualitative research methodologies and their relevance in the field of medical administration. This is actually, we need to know this field is very important for us as medical administration in doing applied researches. And uh, we extend our gratitude to Dr. Samindi Samarakorn and her beloved husband, Professor Mayura Samarakorn for their introduction of our esteemed resource person, Dr. Sujiva Hetiarachi. And uh, your kind words provided us with a deep appreciation of Dr. Hetiarachi's vast knowledge and expertise in the field of qualitative research. So I would like to extend our gratitude to Dr. Sudhat Dharmaratna, uh, the chairperson of our academic committee, the College of Medical Administration and his team uh, for organizing this fruitful session um uh, and uh, 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 and dr reginton dr reginton is one of uh, our younger most junior most colleague um, and his effort and delighted their uh, diligent efforts and designing of flyer and providing support throughout the event and your dedication and creativity made as a, uh, made, made this event a very great success event. And a special thank goes to our resource person, Dr. Sujiv Hetyarachi, senior lecturer from the Sri Javadanpur University English Department. Uh, this is actually a very important session for us because we it was a long-awaited, uh, very important session and uh, your insights have undoubtedly left us lasting impact on all of us. Um, finally, I would like to express our gratitude being uh, on behalf of the College of Medical Administrators to all the participants who joined this session from various corners of Sri Lanka. Uh, your active engagement, thoughtful questions and valuable contributions have made this a very fruitful event. Um, in conclusion, this online session on qualitative research would not have been possible without the collective efforts of all involved. Uh, your enthusiasm, support, and active participation made it an exceptional event that will be remembered for years to come. Once again, um, uh, 
I, I would like to invite Dr. Sujiv Hetiarachi for sharing your knowledge. This two hour session is not enough for us. So I would like to invite on behalf of all the medical administrators to join us and guide us in our future researchers, especially in academic purpose. It's a compulsory thing to conduct researchers in our academic journey. So I would like to invite you to be with us in the future. And thank you very much and have a uh, and uh, good night. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sujiva. Thank you very much. Thanks. Welcome.